Welcome to Way to Be TV, where there's a better way to be than atheist or theist. This evening, we're talking about the early Christian leader, Simon Peter. Among ancient writings, there are Epistles of Peter, the Acts of Peter, a Gospel of Peter, an Apocalypse of Peter, and other writings ascribed to Peter. It would seem that writing books in the name of Simon Peter was a cottage industry in ancient Christianity. Early Christianities wrote about the Gospel of Peter in the late second century. So scholars have known uh, that it existed for a very long time. The gospel itself were not found until the late 1800s. French archaeologists <laughs> discovered fragments of the gospel of Peter and the apocalypse of Peter together in the ancient Egyptian tomb of a monk. The gospel of Peter is thought to have been written in the early second century, centuries before the Christian Bible came together. Now obviously the gospel of Peter was not written by Simon Peter in the second century. We think of Peter as Jesus' closest apostle, and we think of him as one who could not control his mouth. We also know him as one who denied knowing Jesus before the crucifixion and went fishing afterwards. Tradition teaches us that Peter was the founder of the Christian church and a great miracle worker. One scholar that I read this past week proposes that the apocalypse of Peter may have just been another partial fragment of the Gospel of Peter. In any case, the Apocalypse of Peter has Peter speaking in the first person as if he were writing the Apocalypse himself. The book includes an account of Jesus giving Peter a detailed vision of heaven and hell. Given his stature in early Christianities, if there was a Gospel of Peter, why was it not included in the Christian Bible? The Gospel of Peter is probably one of the best examples of the critical arguments over Christology in early Christianities. Why then did the Gospel of Peter not fit in? And we'll talk about this a little later on. Joni, how's it you think of Peter? I think he was a um, type A personality who thought that who, 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 who thought he was the first one to actually believe that Jesus was God's son. Right. And um, but even at the crucifix, uh, while, he, while, while the crucifixion was going on, he lost his courage and he, then that caused him to be um, sorry and self-conscious for, I don't know, till after a certain amount of time had passed. And then he decided he would go about witnessing and telling what he then knew to be the truth about Jesus. But I don't remember... Him <clears throat> specifically performing miracles. Uh, I think I think what I had read and understood in uh, the Gospels or even in Acts was that all of them could go and um, perform miracles in Jesus's name, not in their own names, but in Jesus's name. I mean, that's where the uh, Pentecostal Church literally comes from. Is is from our book called the Acts of the Apostles and these. These, these apostles going out and doing miracles. So let me tell you a little bit about the Gospel of Peter. The Gospel of Peter begins mid-sentence describing how no one among the officials discussing Jesus' plight would wash their hands. So Pilate stood up and washed his. There also seems to be a reference to Joseph of Arimathea who wanted Jesus' body for burial. Many similar details of the Passion story in the Christian canon also appear in the Gospel of Peter, which is not in the Christian canon. They mocked Jesus, calling him the King of Israel. They put a purple robe on him and a crown of thorns. They spit in his eyes. I don't think that's in our Christian Bible. They slapped his cheeks, poked him with sticks, and beat him. Two criminals were crucified with him. Uh, that's similar to our Christian Bible, of course. They divided his clothes, which is also similar to our Christian Bible. The temple veil split in two. 
uh, and that's in our Christian Bible, most of the details would not be surprising to modern day Christians. However, Christians today are thoroughly indoctrinated with the tradition that Jesus suffered horribly and died for the sins of the world. In the Gospel of Peter, there was a major problem. During the crucifixion, the Gospel of Peter says, and I quote, Jesus kept silent as one feeling no pain. Scholars think that this is one of the factors that caused the Gospel of Peter to lose favor. There existed among the many arguments over Christology the idea that Jesus was not really human at all. He was only an apparition, a mirage of sorts. There was no pain because there really was no body. Jesus had been only a spirit. People only thought they saw a body. This, of course, is an unacceptable idea for Christians today. But then appears a second reason the Gospel of Peter may have come up short, is that it concentrates on the Jews as being aware they have made a great mistake. They are responsible for the killing of the Son of God. The Gospel says the Jews and elders and priests wept when they realized what they had done. The Gospel of Peter shows that the Jews were responsible and they felt guilty about it. They knew they were responsible. At this time in early Christianity, continuing Jewish tradition and Jewish law and having a Jewish perception of a monotheistic belief system were popular. So today, as they did back then, Christians might label the Gospel of Peter anti-Semitic. And of course, that's unacceptable. And also today, Christians don't know how exactly when Jesus left the tomb. The Gospel of Peter fills in the blank. There's a story in the Gospel of Peter at the tomb. That night, those guarding the tomb heard a great noise from up in heaven. Two beings came down. The stone by the door broke the plaster seals and rolled away by itself. The two beings that came down from heaven went into the tomb. The, the guards woke up the elders and the others sleeping nearby. They were taking turns keeping watch. While they shouted at each other about what had happened, three men came out of the tomb. Now remember, two beings went into the tomb mm -hmm. and three came out. And Jesus' head was higher than the heavens. Jesus was the third man. Jesus' head was higher than the heavens, the gospel says. And the other two men reached only up to the heavens and no higher. Behind them, a giant cross followed them. A voice came from heaven asking, have you preached to the dead? And the cross answered, yes. When they reported these things to Pilate, everyone was sworn to silence for fear of being stoned by the Jews. Toward the end of the fragment of the Gospel of Peter, Mary Magdalene enters the picture. She is concerned with how she and the other women will roll away the stone. But when they get there, the stone is already rolled away. They look inside and see a shining figure who tells them he's already gone. The Gospel says they were frightened and they left. The final scene of the Gospel of Peter has Peter saying in the first person, me and Andrew and Alphaeus went fishing. And that's the Gospel of Peter. So let's talk about it. It sounds a lot like our gospel, but can you see why, perhaps, that it was that it was left out? Yes. yes. <laughs> Colleen says Peter was Jesus' right hand, so to speak, and that he had and that he had created the Christian church, but I don't recall learning about miracles pertaining to Peter. The Catholic Church hates to change anything. And Jane says I thought Paul created the Christian church. And uh, I learned that it was Peter, says Colleen. What do you think about this, Carol? Can you see why the, the gospel was left out? The gospel of Peter would be left out of the Christian Bible? I can. I can see why. For one thing, the anti-Semitism. Right. I, I swear, though, that, that talking cross <laughs> is, <laughs> is a little bit too far out for me. Well, the talking, the, cross is no, the talking cross is no more supernatural than the um, angels that are at the tomb and I mean they're either supernatural or they're not if you and if you write supernatural stories then you can write whatever you darn well please <laughs> you know yeah right. uh, well I think the two things the anti-semitism and the thing of Jesus not suffering 
Right. Were probably right. The two main things that I can see would keep it out of the Gospels. Jan yeah. says that talking cross is pretty supernatural, and Colleen says absolutely. Oh, yes. Very much so. <laughs> but there were, there were so many ancient books that were written mm -hmm. back then. It was all during the time, hundreds of years now, before we have any kind of canon. All of this literature existed together. Certain people were making these arguments, and other people were making the arguments that we know about. Not all of it would be what Christians today think. And, and, yes. some, of, and some of it would be what the Christians today think. It's changed a lot over the years. And yeah. the only thing we've had to go back to is the printed yeah. uh, Bible that we've, we've grown up with. Um, but there's a, as we're learning now, there's all kinds of fragments of pieces of things out there that uh, may be just as credible as what we've grown up with. Colleen says it just and it went along with what you were saying. It just amazes me the stories the Vatican left out and changing things to suit them, like making Mary Magdalene a prostitute. Dan <laughs> says, I don't know how anyone can reconcile the Trinity. And Colleen says, we do now. And, Tr and Jan says, Trinity equals supernatural. Can't, says, you can't explain the Trinity. Jan, so many religions have a Trinity, similarities as well as differences. And I want us to get to our tour of hell here in a minute. So let me, let me, let me, go, let me go forward a little bit. Have you ever felt threatened, not physically, but mentally? You lose your job if you don't uh, come around and support my position related to whatever. You will jeopardize our friendship or your place in the family if, if you don't start acting differently. You will regret it if you don't accommodate me in some way. These sort of threats come in many forms, and they come all the time. And I know every one of you all have probably felt threatened by somebody at one time or another. Not necessarily that they were going to physically hurt you, but you know you were th being threatened. You were being told, uh, unless you, then. Okay? But when someone says, believe or else, <laughs> they make a supernatural threat. They infer that you will suffer eternally if you do not come around to a certain type of thinking and religious practice. And so probably one of the greatest problems, and you know I pastored four churches, but one of the greatest problems in Christianity today is this idea that, that we tell people, what if you're wrong? What if there really is a hell and you're going to spend eternity in it? Well, i got to tell you, that's not only a supernatural threat, it's rude. It's not something we should do. <laughs> it's not something anyone should do. Just because you believe a supernatural story about a supernatural place with a lot of turmoil and you, and you say to people, you need to become a Christian in order that you not spend eternity in hell is really just on the mean side, okay? It's just meanness. And it sure, sure doesn't reflect what I was taught growing up, the Christian faith is supposed to be. It's not a threat. We will not cover all of the apocalypse of Peter this evening. But it has Peter speaking in the first person concerning a very unusual revelation revealed to him by Jesus. It, it is basically a tour of hell that was going on in the palm of Jesus' hand, by the way. <laughs> Not the traditional picture, but nonetheless much more specific. As you know, Christian tradition has it that each person will be judged and either forgiven or punished for their evil deeds. Or, as my mother used to say, after someone ticked her off, they'll get theirs one day. <laughs> I think we've all said that or heard that at some point in time. So let me give you some of the highlights of this portion of the Apocalypse of Peter. Uh, and as a matter of fact, it's, it's thought that the Apocalypse of Peter may even be simply another part of the fragments of the Gospel of Peter. That is, this fragment goes with the other fragment. Because the other fragment is not the entire Gospel of Peter, and they know there was more of it. As we move through our tour of hell, we come to those who blasphemed. They will be hung by their tongues over an unquenchable fire. As we move on, we come to the for uh, fornicating women who hang over a fiery pit by their braided hair because they wanted to attract men. Just down the way, at the other end of the same pit, are the men, the women attracted, hung by another part of their body. I'll let you use your imagination. <laughs> Next, we come to the murderers. They are cast into a fire with venomous beasts. The pit is also full of worms. 
Their murdered victims watch as the murderers endure endless agony. Nearby is a pit, great and deep, containing those women whose children were born out of wedlock. They are tormented by being swallowed head first. Their children sit alive and cry out to God. Along the way, we see those who despise and break commandments, their own children watching in delight. Next, we find those men and women who persecute and betray righteousness, half of their bodies burning, worms eating uh, their internal organs. And beside them are those who slander, gnawing their own tongues, their eyes being burned with hot pokers. We then find those who deceive, having their lips cut off as the fire enters their mouth and into their vital organs. And beside them, in a place near at hand, are those who trusted their lives to riches and neglected the needy. Now they have on filthy rags themselves. And still another place are the loan sharks, the lenders of money, the usury people. They abide in a place full of foulness. There is another place for the idol worshippers. They jump from a high place, climb back up, and jump again. They cannot stop. They are tormented forever. And still another place, very high up, there are those who dishonored their father and mother. There are men and women whose feet slip. They tumble down into a fire. Again and again they slip. They climb and slip only to be tormented forever. Then we find a place for those proud of their wrongdoing. They suffer countless wounds from birds continually pecking their sores. Up the way are the young women who gave up their virginity. Their skin is slashed and raw. Next we find the slaves who were not submissive to their masters. They gnaw their own tongues and are pestered by perpetual flames. Up next come those who gave alms and then bragged about it. I don't think anybody ever does that, do they, about bragging about what they do for the church and give to the church? <laughs> uh, I think I've heard it all my life. They, they fall on a bed of uh, hot coals over and over without ceasing. Down a piece are the witches and warlocks. They are hung in a fiery pit containing wheels of fire, whirling and spinning without ceasing. The list eventually ends with the simple statement that everyone involved begs for mercy. They are told it is simply too late. So let's let's talk about that. What are they saying on the chat room, Joni? It's pretty awful. Oh, uh, before we finish the other one, it, Colleen said last line of the Lord's Prayer. The Catholics say that now. So anyway, uh, as a child, she was terrified of going to hell or purgatory. The mind games the Catholic Church played on and to the children, a kind of emotional abuse. And when you were describing all those um, places to go and see, sounds like Dante's Inferno, all those yes. circles of hell. Right. And Jan mm -hmm. says, it sounds like a good way to control the masses. And then it says, more than one sin? More than one hell? Cheryl, what do you think about it? <laughs> well, um, I think it's immoral <laughs> to threaten people. Right. With this kind of a thing, and and that's something that the Christian Church has done for years. I don't know. The Baptist is good at that. They're good at the fire and brimstone. Right. You know? I, I wouldn't and, want to go uh, any of those places. No, no, uh, uh. And uh, and you're taught taught that this is real. You know, and this is real, and so you better toe the line. Right. So instead of working to become a better person, you work to obey all the rules and right. not step out of line you, you know. not not to fall off the ladder right 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 well see the thing about it is if you promise eternal riches and delight and and bliss and comfort and so right. forth right. on the one hand and then you and then you promise eternal torment and a hell on the other hand it's what a lot of people not associated with christianity call the carrot and the stick because what you're saying is there's something really great if you make the right decision and there's something really horrible if you make the wrong decision. And, and in between those two decisions, and, and my way of thinking is, is uh, life. And that's what Jesus taught in the way. 
about humility and gentleness and mercy and peace and mm -hmm. and so forth. He talked he talked about uh, how do you live your life in community with other people and to be content and to be a non-anxious presence for them. But this is the last segment of the show in the Christian New Testament. And again, I'm going to reflect back on the Gospel of Peter. But in the Christian New Testament, one writer has Jesus saying as he dies, My God, my God, why have you forsaken me? Right? The writer of the Gospel of Peter has Jesus saying, My power, my power, you have left me behind. Now that's interesting. It's yeah. interesting. Because as, as we've talked about, it, in the time that they were having these arguments over Christology, there were those who be believed there was this divine spark in people. And this divine spark left your body and went back to the supernatural realm, right? Mm -hmm. So the writer of the Gospel of Peter has Jesus saying, my power my on the cross, my power, my power, you have left me behind. Now think about it. Mm -hmm. That's very similar to that divine spark, right? But at the same time, as, as some of you all pointed out, that's also similar to the way. Because what the way says, what Jesus in teaching the people of the way said, it's all about your, your personality, your persona. It's about, it's about when that comes out as a visceral response, it's either acceptable to the world or it's not. We're supposed to make ourselves, make and mold ourselves and work on ourselves to be that kind of person that when we have no time to think, no, no thing, time to plan, no, thing to put, no time to put on any kind of airs. That's what Jesus taught was the way. And that's the part in between this supernatural heaven and this supernatural hell that, that we miss out on altogether in most of the teachings of Christianity. We only put a little bit of gloss on this idea about humility and peace and gentleness and so forth. Instead, we concentrate on this supernatural concept of because I put my faith that Jesus washed away my sins with his blood, that now I'm going to heaven. And because you don't believe that, you're going to hell. And that just leaves life out altogether, doesn't it? But I wonder, when one is tormented by others in their mind, to the point that they lose their way, they lose the power to be humble and to be gentle and to be charitable-minded and to be merciful. Uh, I just wonder, when, when they're tormented enough that they lose their way, I don't want to make too much of it. Perhaps they miss that simple point that Jesus was making, that simple teaching of a simple man who taught how to live and let live in community with other people. Perhaps they miss the way to be all together. What do you got on the chat room, Joni? Anything? Jan says, I wouldn't want to go there either, not even on a tour. And Colleen says, neither would I. But sometimes I think we are already in one of the circles of hell. And Jan says, what happened to forgiveness? Uh, and Colleen says, yeah. double standard for the masses versus the church. Mm -hmm. So basically, he, meaning Jesus, became human as he was dying because he lost the spark. And maybe the church decided his way was too simple Plus, no way for the church to have control. I think that's that gets the gold star right there. It was too simple. Even a child could understand. And it, it was not, um, you know, starry and glittery enough to attract people. So they had to add a whole bunch of stuff to it. Well, the Greek word that we interpret as sin simply means missing the mark. For the church, the way, there is no doing to do. You can't measure people without doing to do and without setting a mark related to that doing. Well, how wonderful would it have been had the church over all these centuries turned out to be people who studied and tried to work on themselves and have this way about them and have that kind of influence on the world. What kind of a, what kind of a world would we have today instead of people... Instead of people who are measuring people's sin and measuring people's flaws and deciding who might be going to hell and who might be going to heaven. Say, go ahead, Carol. I'm sorry. I was going to say that you can't control people with the way. You know? No, there's nothing you can do with that. That's a personal exactly. thing. Exactly. Right. And the church <clears throat> is into controlling. They're into keeping people <clears throat> under the thumb. 
we don't need to concentrate so much on the reward or the punishment that we're mm -hmm. going to get. We need to concentrate on what are we going to do with the life that we have. You know, I heard somebody refer to it. He said, life is a gift. He said, it's a gift without a giver. <laughs> he said, but it's a gift. Any way you look at it, even if it's part of natural selection, it's still a gift. Mm -hmm. And are you making the most of your life? Are you waiting on a miracle? Are you waiting on to die before it's going to be okay and be all right? Mm -hmm. Are you, In other words, are you going to miss the best of what Jesus had to say by waiting mm -hmm. until you're dead? Because certainly the Gospel of Peter is a perfect example of all the things that are in our Christian Bible related to hell and related to the resurrection and related to the, the burial and the crucifixion and so forth. But then at the same time, there's there's a, some very distinct points in there that they make that don't suit what we call orthodox today. That's right. That's right. And therefore, the Christian church doesn't even hardly even know that the Gospel of Peter or the Apocalypse of Peter or the Epistle of Peter or any of those things that were part of the cottage industry of people who wrote in Peter's name. But they, the Christian, the Christian uh, society doesn't know anything about those books. I think people should make their own decisions of what they believe and don't believe, but I don't think they ought to be, uh, I don't think that stuff ought to be hidden from them, and I don't think they should isolate themselves. Uh, instead, if you can listen to all there is to listen to and, to, and to consider all there is to consider, and then what it is you believe even especially the supernatural, what you believe, then that really does take faith. Mm -hmm. But it takes no faith to just believe what you've been indoctrinated to believe, and that's, that's all. True. And you that's never true. heard about anything else. It takes no faith to do that, because you well, only no have effort. the one choice. It's like it's like a multiple choice question with only one one selection <laughs> A. <laughs> you know, and you've never looked at A, B, C, D, and E, and maybe even none of the above. You got anything else on the chat room, Jenny? Well, Colleen was uh, agreeing with something, but I'm not sure what. She said, yes, they are. And then the next one, she said, T, but I think that was a start on. Then you really have not lived, so the gift of life would be wasted. But we all, we all look at other people and say, who can I identify that's worse than me? And then I feel better about myself. And I know a few people. I mean, there's not a lot of them out there, but there are people with this way about them who I feel like you can set them down anywhere, they're comfortable in their own skin, and they're not out there to prove anything. Mm -hmm. And they deal with each person exactly the same mm -hmm. and, and have no yeah. issues about that, and it makes them more content and they're more pleasant in their lives. Mm -hmm. And uh, I want to be one of those. A hundred years ago, we only had a few hundred manuscripts. Today, we have 5,700. We know full well many, many things that we never knew before in history. And it's making a lot of what Christianity touts and does more and more difficult every day. And I think Christianity is, is a wonderful thing that has much within it to be salvaged and needs to be salvaged. And I love the Christian church. But what I also believe is that the Christian church should not make these demands and push itself upon people. Christianity has gotten so pushy and so dog sure. You never hear anyone say they know the absolute truth unless they're standing behind a pulpit or they are a religious zealot of some sort. So thanks again. Thank you for being with us. We love you. And we'll see you next Thursday evening on Way to Be TV, where there's a better way to be than atheist or theist. Mm -hmm.